Rosicrucian and Christianity Lectures by Max Heindel Narrated by Matthew Schmitz Lecture 3 Spiritual Sight and the Spiritual Worlds In the first lecture, we saw that the only theory of life which will bear the searchlight of reason is the theory that the human ego is immortal, that earth life is a school, and that the ego returns to that school life after life to learn its lessons under the twin laws of nature, the laws of consequence and rebirth, thus progressing steadily towards the goal of perfection. The foregoing solution to the riddle of life naturally elicits the question, but if those whom we call dead are really alive, why do we not see them, and where are they? That question was answered in the second lecture, where it was shown inductively, deductively, and by direct incontrovertible testimony, that there is an invisible world about us inhabited by the so-called dead, who are living, they are in full possession of their every faculty, and that the only reason why we do not ordinarily perceive them is because we lack the necessary sense. The blind fail to observe light and color, because they lack physical sight. We are blind to the spiritual worlds because we lack spiritual sight. All have this sixth sense latent, and it is capable of being awakened in all without exception by proper methods, as shown in lecture number 11 of this series. In the present lecture, we are to investigate the inner worlds, and it may not be out of place to give a general idea of how the clairvoyant knows about the invisible worlds and to show the scope and limitations of clairvoyance. Clairvoyant is the name given to persons who see objects invisible to ordinary humanity. The name means simply clear-sighted, and contrary to the general accepted idea, there are different kinds of clairvoyance. Some are like a prisoner behind a barred window, who can see everything within his limited range of vision, and according to whether his window chances to face upon a narrow prison yard or upon a wide expanse of country, will be his scope of vision. If his view is further hampered by a shutter which he cannot control, which opens and shuts independently of his will, we shall understand that his observation is of little value to himself or others. Some clairvoyants are like this prisoner. When the shutter is opened, they have a view of whatever happens to be going on in that part of the inner world which they chance to see at a given time and place. They cannot help seeing whether the vision pleases them or not. They must endure it until it passes away of itself. Such people are called negative, involuntary clairvoyance. Others, again, while limited in the scope of their vision, have control of the shutter, which they open and shut at will, seeing anything which comes within range. They are also negative, but are able to see at will, and are called voluntary clairvoyance. Then again, others have a faculty which may be likened to the state of a prisoner, whose prison is a glass house situated upon a hill and supplied with telescopes of the highest magnitude, shaded by blinds of such a construction that they would open as soon as he looked at them and close as soon as he turned away. Thus he would have perfect control over his vision, being able to see or not, and to turn his gaze to any subject he desired to investigate, and would therefore be a voluntary, trained clairvoyant. There is a higher stage where the prison doors are opened, and the man is able to leave the dense body at will, go into the invisible worlds, and investigate at close range the things he wishes to know about, which the last-named class could view only from a distance. Leaving the dense body at will is, of course, the ideal method. Then the man is not only a clairvoyant, he is a citizen of two or more worlds. That stage is not generally reached by a mere investigator, but by such as have taken a vow to dedicate their lives to the service of humanity. They are then called invisible helpers, and work under the guidance of the great leaders of humanity, our elder brothers. While many people make the mistake of being incredulous of the existence of supersensuous worlds, there are also people who go to the other extreme, when they have become convinced of the verity of the invisible world, and think that when anyone can see clairvoyantly, all truth is open to his vision, and he at once knows all about those higher worlds. That is a great mistake. The fallacy of such an idea is readily understood by comparison with everyday affairs, 
We do not consider that, because a man who was born blind has been made to see, he at once knows all about everything in the physical world. Nay, more, we know that even those of us who have had our eyesight all our lives are far from having a universal knowledge of the things about us. Logic and analogy are violated by applying such a supposition to the inner worlds. In fact, no clairvoyant, however accomplished, has a knowledge of everything there, but only knows what he has investigated. A blind person who has obtained sight must learn to use his eyes to gauge distance, etc., so must the infant, and so the clairvoyant must be trained before his faculty becomes of value, and it is invariably the case that the more proficient people become, the more modest they are in their statements, and the more willing to defer to the visions of others, knowing how much is unknown, and realizing how few of the many sides of a subject a single investigator can cover. Besides, in the physical world, forms are stable and do not easily change, but in the inner worlds everything is in the most intense motion. Forms change in a way and with a faculty that is but dimly pictured in our fairy tales. The wonder is not that involuntary or untrained clairvoyance often sadly mix things, but rather that they see anything right. The training consists in teaching the neophyte how to look beyond the form, which is evanescent and illusory, to the life which is the same no matter what form it may take. For only when the life can be seen is there safety from glamour. Before proceeding to the investigation of the invisible worlds, we must first state the Rosicrucian conception of the physical world as it differs somewhat from the generally accepted views. The Chemical Region of the Physical World In everyday life we distinguish between solids, liquids, and gases, these are grouped by science into about 70 inorganic elements, such as hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon. From these elements, all forms are built. We also discriminate four kingdoms, mineral, plant, animal, and human. But that distinction has reference to four streams of evolving spirits at various states of development, manifesting as life, which molds the chemical elements into the multitudinous forms we see about us. This fourfold stream of life is more or less firmly enmeshed in the forms it has built according to the stage of development reached by the various streams of spirits. The spirits which compose the mineral life stream are so feeble, and hence so closely allied with the matter they shape into inorganic crystals, that they seem inseparable from it. This life stream is known as chemical force. The spirits in the plant life stream assimilate the crystallized chemical elements and modify the crystals into crystalloids when building their more complex bodies. These plant forms, when taken in turn by the animal and human life streams, are grouped as cells and organs which collectively compose the more intricate vehicles of the two higher kingdoms. While the three more evolved streams of life are working with the chemical matter, the mineral life embedded therein becomes inert or, in a certain sense, it dies. But the moment the plant life, animal life, or human life has departed from a form, which we then call dead, the mineral life native to the chemical matter is once more free to assert itself and manifest as the chemical forces which make for decay and resolve the form into its original constituents. Some scientists attribute feeling to minerals, to dead plants and dead animal tissue. The observations of science are correct, but it is a serious misnomer to call that feeling which is merely a response to impacts of the mineral life which ensouls the form when not appropriated to the use of one of the higher life streams. The mineral life stream embodied in the tissue which the scientific experimenters use merely registers an impression. It is incapable of true feeling, such as pleasure and pain. These are soul qualities and predicate an inner consciousness capable of working over the impressions made upon it. This is as yet beyond the mineral life, and therefore all forms, as such, are devoid of feeling as the chemical elements of which they are composed. Science recognizes this when it states that there is no feeling in a finger which is hurt, but inconsistently relegates the feeling of pain to the brain. The occult scientist holds that all form, brain, brawn, or bone, equally lack feeling, for feeling is a life process, neither inherent in the solids, liquids, or gases, nor acquired by them, during the time they are appropriated by the evolving life streams, to furnish the substance for the various forms through which these life streams express themselves in the dense, visible, physical world. 
Thus, if man possessed no more than the dense body, he would be as incapable of manifesting life as are the chemical substance of which that body is composed, and if there were only this visible physical world, there could never have been any other forms than the inert crystals, plants, animals, and man, would have been impossible achievements in nature. The Etheric Region of the Physical World The Rosicrucians, in harmony with other occult schools, divide each world into seven regions, or states of matter. Our visible world comprises but three such reasons, such as solid, liquid, and gaseous. The invisible ether occupies the four remaining regions, and it is with the investigation of this fourfold ether that the research of occult science begins. These four states of ether are called the etheric region. Ether is the medium through which the solar energy flows into the dense bodies of plant, animal, and man, and thus it forms a basis for the manifestation of life and vitality. The names and specific functions of these four states of ether, counting from below, are as follows. 1. The chemical ether is the medium of manifestation for the chemical forces which cause the formation of crystals, manifesting as the loves and hates of the atoms, the elective affinity spoken of by Goethe, whereby alcohol and water readily mix, but oil and water refuse to commingle. Other forces manifest in this ether to promote assimilation, growth, and excretion, as seen in the higher kingdoms of plant, animal, and man. The chemical ether alone is active in the mineral chemical elements in their native state. 2. The life ether. A fish can live and move in water. Animal and man cannot. They live in air which suffocates the fish. So each realm of nature is the medium of manifestation for intelligences of diverse constitution at varying stages of development and having different missions in the economy of nature. While the forces operating in the chemical ether are solely concerned with the maintenance of the separate form, the life ether is the vantage ground for the propagative forces which have for their object the perpetuation of the species or race. It is thus active in plant, animal, and man. 3. The light ether is the medium of manifestation of the forces which produce heat, motion, and the circulation of the blood in animal and man and of the sap in plants. Through it, the green chlorophyll is deposited on the leaves, and so is the coloring on the flowers, animal, and man. It is the avenue of ingress for the solar force which builds the eye and is the avenue of sight. The forces in this ether are only partially operative in the plant, fully in animal and man. 4. The reflecting ether is the substance of the highest region of the physical world, and the images or records of all that is or ever has been in the physical world can be found there. Therefore we say that it contains the memory of nature. Here the architect's idea for a building spoken of in the second essay is recoverable at any time, whether he is dead or living. But the reflecting ether deserves its name in more than one way, for the images found there, though reproducing objects found in the physical world, are nevertheless but reflections of images in a much higher world, where the records are permanent, much clearer, and more definite. The record in the reflecting ether is only read by involuntary clairvoyants and psychometrists, who have no choice even though they may have heard of the existence of the higher records. Sometimes the occult pupil also reads the record in the reflecting ether when he first starts to investigate the invisible realms, but he is instructed as to its scope and does not deceive himself into thinking that it is the ultimate of perfection, and in time learns to use the higher record. This ether is a most important realm in nature. It is the avenue of ingress whereby the ego manipulates the brain and the nervous system and controls its dense body, and in the reflecting ether, the ego in man makes the record of its experiences which we call memory. Science teaches that, alike in the densest solid and in the rarest gas, no two atoms touch, but all float, as it were, in a sea of ether. That is true, but it is only part of the story. If that were all, it would be impossible to explain logically the difference between the four kingdoms. We know that in order to function in the visible world, it is necessary to have a dense body. Without such a body, we would be ghosts, invisible to other physical beings. The same is true of the other worlds. 
In order to function in them or express their peculiar qualities, we must first have a vehicle made of their materials, and as it is necessary to have a dense body before we can act in the physical world, so we must have a vital body before we can show life, assimilate, grow, or propagate. The mineral stream of life at present embodied in the matter of the chemical region has no separate vital body. The plant, animal, and man have vital bodies, but they are as differently constructed as their respective dense bodies, varying as to the quality, quantity, and organization of their component etheric matter. Yet even the possession of a dense body and a vital body is not sufficient to account for all the facts of life. If there were no other realms in nature, movable animal and human bodies would be impossibilities, and even if such had been created, having the power to move, the incentive to motion and action, would be lacking. The occult scientist finds action has its inception in the desire world. Like the physical world, this realm of nature is also composed of seven regions which divide the matter according to relative density and other qualities. When we speak of matter there, it is something very different from that of the physical world. The difference is very hard to describe, because all our terms are coined with reference to the sense world, and the best that can be done is to give some faint idea of what it is or is not like. In the first place, though desire matter is one degree less dense than physical matter, desire stuff is not by any means finer physical matter. It is true that the ultimate atom of all physical forms is the same, that the mountain, the mayflower, the mouse, and the man are all built of the same kind of atoms, yet we do not say that the mouse is a finer degree of mountain. A similar difference is embodied in the statement of the relative density of the two kinds of matter, which makes one amenable to law inoperative in the other. Desire matter is particularly characterized by the ease with which it is molded into different forms and is capable of changing from one form to another. Plasticity is far too poor a name for this quality. Besides, desire matter is also an embodiment of light and color of such luminosity such scintillating iridescent hues as make our brightest colors and our most glorious sunsets seem dull and dead by comparison. It was this dazzling luminosity which caused the medieval alchemists to designate it astral, starry, though it has nothing to do with the stars. A faint conception of what it is like may be had by taking an abalone shell and watching the changing play of colors while moving it to and fro in the sunshine. To obtain a reasonable understanding of the desire world, we must realize that it is the world of feeling, desire, wishes, and emotions. As our bones, blood, and flesh are formed of chemical matter, so our desires and emotions are formed of the matter of the desire world, and as our dense bodies are subject to gravity and other physical laws, so our desires, etc., are dominated by attraction and repulsion, the two great forces in the desire world. Repulsion is the predominant force in the three lower or denser regions. Attraction alone holds sway in the three upper regions where matter is rarest, but is also present to some degree in the three lower regions, where it opposes the force of repulsion. The central region is the region of feeling. Here, interest in, or indifference to, an object or idea sways the balance in favor of one or the other of the two forces, attraction or repulsion thereby relegating the object or idea which engendered the feeling to the three higher or the three lower regions, or, as the case may be, expelling it from our lives. An illustration will show the principle and show how these twin feelings are the mainsprings that move the world by means of the twin forces. Both animals and man have a desire body and are swayed by the twin feelings and the twin forces. A tigress in the jungle will pass a loaf of bread with indifference but she will feel interested in the owner. Her interest will rouse the force of attraction, yet she will endeavor to kill him. The destructive act is not the end and the aim, however, but only a necessary step towards assimilation. If she spies another beast of prey having designs on what she considers her booty, that also will cause her to feel interest. But in that case, the feeling of interest will arouse the force of repulsion, and if a fight ensues, destruction of her adversary will be an end in itself. In the above case, and in cases where the animal desires of man are factors, the twin forces and twin feelings operate alike, but there is a difference in the composition of the desire body of man and animal. 
The desire body of an animal is composed solely of matter from the four lower regions of the desire world. Hence, it is incapable of feeling any but the animal desires for food, shelter, and the like. A saint would feel the keenest remorse if he had inadvertently spoken a hasty word. The tigress remains undisturbed by any sense of wrong, though she killed daily. The reason is that man's desire body is composed of the matter of all the seven regions of the desire world, so that he is capable of feeling in a higher sense than the animal. Another illustration will make the point clear. Three men are walking along a road. They see a sick dog, covered with sores, evidently suffering intense pain and famishing. This much is evident to all three men. It is the testimony of their senses. Now comes the feeling. One feels indifferent to the animal and passes on without another look, leaving the dog to its fate. Not so the others. They are both interested and remain, but this feeling of interest manifests differently in the two men. The interest of one man is of a sympathetic, helpful nature, impelling him to care for the poor beast, to endeavor to assuage its pain and nurse it back to health. In him, the feeling of interest has aroused the force of attraction. The other man's interest is of an opposite nature. He sees only a loathsome object which offends his aesthetic sense, and he wishes to rid himself and the world of such a pest as quickly as possible. He is in favor of killing the animal outright and burying it. In him the feeling of interest has generated the destructive force, repulsion. Thus we see that all action and refrainment from action, which is negative action, is due to the twin feelings, interest, which starts the twin forces of attraction and repulsion, and indifference, that simply cuts us off from the object or idea it is directed against. If our interest in an object or idea generates repulsion, that, of course, also causes us to endeavor to expurgate it from our lives, but, as shown by the illustrations, there is a great difference in the action of the force of repulsion and the feeling of indifference. Thus we see that a dense body, formed of the inert substance of the chemical region, quickened and vitalized by the vital body, composed of the ethers of the etheric region, receives the incentive to action from the desire body, an incentive which the animals follow absolutely, but which in man is checked by another factor, reason, which sometimes causes him to act contrary to desire. Were there no other realms in nature but the physical world and the desire world, that factor would be non-existent. We could have mineral, plant, and animal, but man, a thinking, reasoning being, would be an impossibility in nature. The world of thought must be taken into consideration to account for man. For from its substance, the mind is formed to act as a break upon the impulses of the desire body, dictating action contrary to the urge of the twin feelings because of wider viewpoint arrived at by reason. The world of thought also consists of seven regions in which the matter is classified according to density and quality. Besides, it is divided into two main sections, the region of concrete thought and the region of abstract thought. In the three lowest divisions of the region of concrete thought are the archetypes of everything we see in the physical world, as mineral, plant, animal, and man, of the continents, rivers, and oceans, and here the trained clairvoyant whose faculty enables him to reach these high realms sees also the universal ocean of flowing life in which all forms are immersed, sees the same vital impulse moving from form to form in rhythmic cycles, sustaining the form specialized by the ego of man or the animal and plant group spirit. These archetypes are not merely models in the sense we generally speak of models as a thing in miniature or in a finer material, they are creative archetypes, molding all the visible forms, such as we see in the world, in their own likeness, or rather likenesses, for often many of the archetypes work together to form a certain species, each archetype giving part of itself to build the required form. They are marshaled and directed by the archetypal forces, which are found in the fourth division. From the substance of the four lower divisions, our mind is formed, enabling man to also form thoughts and make images which he may afterwards reproduce in iron, stone, or wood, so that by means of the mind which he obtains from this world, man becomes a creator in the physical world, like the archetypal forces. But what is that which directs the mind as the archetypal forces guide the operations of the archetypes? It is the ego, 
and it gathers its clothing or garment from the three highest sections, which are called the region of abstract thought and ideas. Thus we see that man is a very complex being, and a citizen of three worlds to which he is correlated by an unbroken chain of five vehicles, thereby giving him a full waking consciousness which enables him to see objects in space outside himself in clear and sharp contours. The animal has no individual spirit yet, but has a so-called group spirit, which informs all the members of a species. The separate animals have three bodies, a dense, a vital, and a desire body, but lack one link in the chain, mind. Hence animals do not ordinarily think, but as we induce electricity in a wire by bringing it closer to another which is charged, so in a similar way by contact with man a semblance of thought has been induced in the higher domestic animals, such as the dog, horse, and elephant. The other animals obey the prompting, which we call instinct, of the animal group spirit. They do not see objects in such clear outlines as does man. In the lower species, the animal consciousness revolves itself more and more into an internal picture consciousness, resembling man's dream state, except that their pictures are not confused, but convey perfectly to the animal the promptings of the group spirit. The plants have a dense body and a vital body, hence they can neither feel nor think. They lack desire body and mind, and therefore a greater gap exists between the plant and its group spirit than between the animal and its group spirit. Hence the consciousness of the plants is correspondingly dimmer, resembling our state of dreamless sleep. The mineral body has only a dense body, it lacks three links to connect it with its group spirit. It therefore is inert, and its unconsciousness resembles that of the dense human body in the trance state, when the human spirit, the ego, has passed correspondingly beyond it. In conclusion, let us note that the three worlds in which we live are not separated by space. They are all about us, as light and color, embedded in the physical matter, as lines of cleavage in the mineral. If we let a dish of water freeze and examine it under a microscope, we shall see the ice crystals divided off from one another by lines. These were present, though unseen in the water as lines of force, invisible until the proper condition brought them out. So one world lies embedded in the next above, unseen to us until we provide the proper conditions. But when we have fitted ourselves, nature, who is ever ready to unfold to us her wonders, expresses ardent joy over everyone who as a helper in evolution thus attains to citizenship in the invisible realms.